right. We're here. Please tell me if the microphone is sounding okay today. Should yeah. be okay. I hope. I recorded with it not too long ago. Yeah. You got your Riddick goggles on. That's just in case uh, I got I got that. They're actually my green ones. They're not my Riddick. Oh These yeah, are that's my green right. Ones. These are my sexual Tyrannosaur goggles. In case <laughs> in case I have to become a sexual. Yeah, they go. They go with my sexual tyrannosaur hat. Oh, see? he's got a whole thing. See, I got a whole thing. It's this a whole is, ensemble. I might turn into a dinosaur. Did you fuck a moment? <laughs> sexual dinosaur from another era. <laughs> so yeah, might want to stay tuned for that. <laughs> yeah, fucking watch out. Tell me, man. Only fans. <laughs> yeah, we'll start one of those one of these days. <laughs> Probably all kinds of fucking people out there to pay to see a sexual dinosaur. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Including all of Chuck Tingle's fans. Chuck Tingle. <laughs> I have all these fucking crazy ass gay dudes fucking watching my OnlyFans. <laughs> Me dress up like a damn dinosaur. Yeah, you need one of those big suits. You yeah. Know what I mean? Dinosaur. Yeah, just go around. Dinosaur doing solo scenes and shit. <laughs> sexy dinosaur. Yeah. Sexy fucking dinosaur. Zach could pay for that, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know. If he was here, you could ask him. I'll see you yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're talking about a movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you hear any noises in the background, it's because it's been storming here. Bad storm, yeah. For two days. So yeah. hopefully, like I saw some lightning and shit earlier, but I don't say, I think the power should stay on. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Louis saying the film that got Denise Huxtable kicked off the Cosby show. Yeah. I, it, you know what's weird? Okay. So at least according to the Wikipedia page, I mean, we'll get into this movie in a minute. Uh, and this is kind of about the movie. Because Lisa, Lisa Bonet in, is in this. And this was kind of her big film role, you know, after she'd been on The Cosby Show. Now, she had read the script, so she knew what it entailed. Because, you know, she's naked a lot in this. And, um, you know, and it's like big sex scenes and stuff. So apparently Bill Cosby said, you know, yeah, you, you should be in the movie. But then after the movie came out, he didn't like it. And so I think that he contributed to her getting kicked off the show because he was like, oh yeah, they just put her in the movie, uh, you know, so they, so they could show her having sex and doing voodoo and stuff. And I'm like, Bill Cosby, where the fuck do you get off? Like telling well, other people. Well, you know what that was That's all what about. I mean. You know what he was doing. Jesus. He wanted to see it. Yeah. He wanted to see it. His rapist ass. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. So I was just like, shut up. Nobody listens. And then to that after he's like, oh, I can't do that. I thought, I think, first of all, I think this is a great movie. It's a paranormal kind of crime drama. Yeah, it's like it's like satanic noir, yeah. Yeah. which there needs to be more of those. I feel like I saw it when it came out. I I forgot that it was a '50s period piece. Yeah, I just knew that it was in happening in, like in the South down in 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 New Orleans, and being from that area, fucking I I forgot that it was '50s because it still looked like that in the '80s. It looked like you know. It well, they did much. shoot it in an actual. I mean, the place where they shot it in New Orleans. It's set uh, yeah. partially in New York City as well, and I'll kind of get into that. But the place they shot it in New Orleans was actually kind of an abandoned like worker camp or worker yeah. village. Yeah, that wasn't far from the way it looked in the eighties. Yeah, it's still in parts of it. You know, yeah, not all of it, but uh, it looked about like that. I forgot it was a period piece. I remember we were kids. Me and all my friends were talking about how fucking hot Lisa, Lisa Bonet was. And it, she was it, very hot in this. And movie. it aged well. Yeah, she's she very attractive, very attractive uh, young lady. Uh, fucking good sex scenes. But you know, she was wild. She was she in that on on that Huxable program, you know what I mean? She was kind of portraying kind of an all-American girl, but we knew even as kids that she was a wild ass. She was kind of like Angelina Jolie, where you know what I mean, fucking nuts. But fun. So it wasn't really out of character her for do, for her to do this movie from our point of view. It was a good role for her. I yeah. thought. I thought she was great in this. Yeah, I, I mean, think I think older people were shocked, but fuck, man, older people are always shocked at what young people do. <laughs> They're always clutching. Bro. Yeah. Oh my. Oh. Oh my God. Oh. But to us, it was just yeah, right on. Yeah, work it. God damn, look at that. You know, we were just. I remember what it was like. Fucking, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. A lot of guys liked her, you know, fucking white guys and black guys liked her, you know. She was, of course, she was looking kind of, you know, she was mixed, so she was, you know, she was attractive, you know. Everybody liked her. Well, like I said, she was, yeah. a, you know, it's not a huge part in this, yeah. but it's, you know, it's uh, It was enough to make you role. see the movie. She was, she well, was yeah. what called people to the movie. Yeah. But it was a good movie when you saw it. It's filmed very well. The acting's really good. Robert De Niro's a, it's a, I forgot how young De Niro was in this movie. In 87, yeah. In 87, he still was a young man. 
us, we thought it is thought of him as an old man, but well, we were yeah. kids. Yeah. But look at him now. He's like, what, maybe 40? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe 40. And like a well-preserved 40. Played a pretty good devil. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. So, okay. So this came out, this is Angel Heart, by the way. This came out in 1987. Now, what ended up happening with this? Okay. So I think that a couple of y'all, I don't remember who it was, but a long time ago, somebody requested, oh, you guys should do a movie retrospective on Angel Heart. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember seeing that. I either saw it on cable or I rented it like back in the late eighties or early nineties, somewhere around there, probably when I was in high school. And I remember really digging it, but I couldn't remember a lot about it other than Robert De Niro's The Devil, there's voodoo in it, and that's kind of, and it was like a noir. That was like all I remembered. But I remembered it being really cool. So when you guys first um, asked about it, I was kind of like looked it up and it was really hard to find on any of the streaming services. I'm like, what the fuck? Either or you had to like pay really you know, expensive to get like a Blu-ray or whatever. And I said, well, fuck it. So I put it on the back burner. But then I realized like probably like a month ago, it turned up on pretty much all the streaming services. I think it's on Amazon Prime, on free to me I think it's on Hulu. Uh, you might be able to watch it on Pluto TV for free as well, although that might have ads. And I was just like, well, hot damn. So I put it in the Patreon poll two or three times, but it never won. So finally, like last night, I was looking around. I was like, what movie do I want to talk about in the matinee? I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to rewatch Angel Heart because I haven't seen it in such a long time. And I want to see if it's as good as I remembered. And guess what? It was even better than I remembered. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that. that it that, aged really well. Yeah, it, watching, it reminded, re, watching it reminded me of uh, that first season of True Detective. Yeah, kind of. A lot like True Detective. Kind of. Kind of had some of the same visual styles to it. Although same area, but different different uh time period this is a beautiful looking Kinda movie like, yeah i'd forgot how beautiful it was um alan parker directed this uh if you guys don't know he directed all kind of shit he directed a uh, pink floyd the wall um he did fucking uh fame evita uh midnight express mississippi burning um all that kind of stuff so he's done all kind of different stuff he just died last year i think which mm. is why because i saw like a lot of uh you know horror blogs and stuff like revisiting this recently and that's probably why because alan parker uh died not too long ago now this was actually based on a novel that came out <clears throat> excuse me in 1978 called falling angel by william hjortzberg and um pretty much as soon as the novel came out and it was kind of a hit and so he started he wrote like a screenplay treatment of it and was shopping it around to different uh, studios. Now, I think Paramount had the rights for a time and they were going to make it, but then they kind of lost interest or whatever. And so it took a really long time to get it made. Interestingly, the book, I haven't read it, but I read like a couple synopses of it. Interestingly, the book, the whole thing takes place in New York City. Uh, in this one, it's kind of like, you know, New York in the first half or the first third of it. And then the rest of it is in New Orleans. Oh, you put your glasses on? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even notice you doing that. I'm going back in time to the dinosaur era. I'm <laughs> when, in the Jurassic when dinosa area. When I dinosaurs mean, wore goggles. When dinosaurs fuck. I, I remember that. <laughs> That's the name of that new video, When Dinosaurs Fuck. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Gramther's Hammer said, uh, Louis Cipher, Lucifer, were you surprised when that was revealed? No. No, we saw it coming. We were um, I mean, everybody... Now, it, now, interestingly, okay, so so they changed a couple things, like I said, from the book. The book, the whole thing's in New York City. It still had voodoo and stuff like that in it, but it you know, was kind of different. They also changed a little bit about the character of Harry Angel, who's like the main guy, is played by Mickey Rourke in the movie. They made him kind of more sympathetic, and they also kind of switched around. I mean... It's not a, okay, so it, it's not a twist that Robert De Niro is the devil. I mean, duh, obviously. And pretty much the first scene you see him, because he's not in it a lot. He's only like in three or four scenes. He turns up periodically. The first time you see him, you know there's something like fucking creepy about the dude. Um, you know, he's got long ass fingernails. He's like, you know, spooky looking. And he's got the fucking cane and whatnot. And he says, he's, I'm looking for this dude. And it's like talking a, about souls. contract and he's talking about souls, souls and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's like, you pretty much know he's the devil. So that's not even a twist. I don't even think, and I don't even think that was intended to be a twist, that he was yeah. the devil. I mean, because it was obvious from the outset. What was a twist? Should we even spoil it? I don't know. Because it, it came out now, in 87, though. The thing is, though, is like uh, for a lot of younger people, this, this would be classic theater. Or class, <laughs> classic cinema. <laughs> So, you know what I mean? You might be kind of robbing them of the opportunity to see this movie. This movie is a very artistic movie, 
but it's not so artistic that it's elevated out of the realm of the average person to appreciate it. It's shot really well. Yeah, it's a, gorgeous. A lot, a, yeah, this where it's set, the setting is pretty uh, cool. You know, broken down bad areas of fucking New Orleans in the in the and New York. 50s. They and shot New a lot York. of it in Harlem. Yeah, in the fifties. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this private detective is going to kind of like these black neighborhoods in, investigating this shit. And he meets up with this Lisa Bonet, this hot ass fucking, I don't know, you probably call her quadroon, quadroon, octoroon girl. And he starts an affair with her. And just the way it's shot, you know what I mean? Hot sex scenes, her fucking house leaks fucking water through the roof like crazy, but they're still cracking. <laughs> tearing it up, the fucking water coming down in the house, and although that weird might shit not happens. actually be happening, we don't know what's. It's, it's you just got to see it. It's a know? very because the thing about it, this is a very one of those movies where it almost seems like a straightforward narrative, but it's really not. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say it's as out there as something like Mulholland Drive or something like that, but there is some kind of shit in this where there's like one, there's a shit ton of symbolism, yeah. and there's also. A shit ton of stuff where they do where you think that things happen in a certain order because of the way it's edited, but it didn't actually happen in that order. And it's like hard for me to talk about without spoiling like what the big reveal is. You not find that, out Satanists are involved and stuff. Not that not that uh, Louis Cipher is the devil. Everybody knows that, but it's like yeah. I'm talking about the other twist. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. So so the story behind this. Uh, Harry Angel is a kind of a rundown, uh, you know, private detective in New York City. He gets contacted by this apparently wealthy dude named Louis Cipher, played by Robert De Niro. And he says, uh, I'm looking for this dude. He was a very, quite a famous crooner uh, back during the war, like back in the 40s. Uh, his name was Johnny Favorite. And he and I had a contract and he has disappeared. Um, he suffered from shell shock during the war. He came home, they put him in a convalescent hospital, but I suspect that he had dis he's disappeared from there because he's like, I dropped by there to see where he was and they were kind of cagey and wouldn't tell me everything. So he's like, I'm paying you money and I want you to go find him. So the rest of the movie is Harry Angel traveling around, talking to various other people, trying to determine the whereabouts of this elusive person named Johnny Favorite. And as this happens, he gets deeper and deeper into uh, the occult, the voodoo stuff. And it turns out too, that every time he goes and talks to a person and gets information from them, uh, shortly afterward, they end up murdered in a really, really horrible way. Um, you know, so like the first person, he's like shot through the eye. Uh, it looks like a suicide. The second one, like one guy gets his, like his dick cut off and stuck in his mouth and he's like strangled. One woman gets her heart cut out. So there's like all this. So it's really interesting because it's, it's structured very much like a noir. So it's almost kind of like Chinatown or something like that. But then there's like these horrific murders and like horrific gore in it. And also like really, really steamy, like sex scenes. So much so that when this movie first came out and went like went through the MPAA, they were gonna give it an X rating. Um, and Alan Parker appealed the decision like a bunch of times. He's like, look, man, he's like, please don't make me. Cause he'd spent like four months editing it. Cause he edited it as well. And, um, and the sex scene was edited in a specific way. And he's just like, I really don't want to take any of it out. Uh, but MPA were like, no, you know, you, you can't have it. It's too smutty. So he ended up having to take out 10 seconds for the theatrical release. Although I will tell you that I think when it came out on home video and what DVD and stuff, I'm pretty sure they put that 10 seconds back in, right back in there. because I think that the, um, the version that I watched on, uh, Amazon prime it was pretty long. I'm pretty sure that that 10 seconds was back yeah. in there. Yeah. Well, because I think the only thing they took out was the 10 seconds with, uh, with Mickey Rourke, very, uh, obviously like thrusting into yeah. Lisa Bonet, like his, like his it's butt not and real. all the blood dripping from the ceiling. It's not stuff. real explicit. I no, mean, it's not. It, it, not it's, at all. It's artistically shy. It's not pornography. No. Uh, I wouldn't even really call it eroticism. It, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a steamy scene, but it's not, they made, they, I think they made a big deal out of it. I mean, well, yeah. Um, the, the, the director thought that too. He's like, that yeah. was the biggest fucking waste of time ever. Yeah. Cause you see stuff like that in other movies. There wasn't really anything that special about it in terms of what actually happened or how it was shot. Well, the weird what thing was special is was just Lisa. Lisa yeah. fucking, she was in the prime of her fucking life at, the, at that period. She looked fucking great. And, 
in those days, nobody had seen what she looked like without her clothes off, and everybody was wondering. <laughs> Especially everybody in my generation back there were like, wonder what she looks like fucking without that, without that damn skirt on. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> fucking funny. And, you know, she's like giving the fans what they wanted. She looked good. Real good. Well, and you have yeah. to think, too, that when you're so known for playing a, kind of a wholesome yeah. sort of role, like on a family-friendly show, right? after a while, that's you've really got to get sick of that. And yeah. you're just like, man, I just want to be in a fucking, I'm going to, you know, cut open chickens and let them bleed yeah. all over me and let my tits hang out and stuff like Especially that. Especially that's like, not that's not how she was as a person. She was wild. She was kind of like, she was, she wasn't as crazy as, uh, as what's her name. I just fucking mentioned her before, uh, but I would compare her to, um, um. Shit, the girl who, the girl who played fucking Laura Croft. Uh, Angelina Jolie. And yeah, I would compare her to Angelina. I compared her to Angelina Jolie. Angelina was much crazier in a bad way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Lisa Bonet wasn't crazy in, 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 in... She was she was fucking fun, but she wasn't that crazy, you know? But she's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Remember remember, remember the, all the rumors that would come up about, about her around that time? Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't she run around with Lenny Kravitz at that time? Or was it a little bit later? I can't remember when that was. I thought she was dating Lenny Kravitz a little bit later. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I thought that. I thought that. I too. think that's what it was. Yeah, which that would have made a good pair. Well, Although Lenny Kravitz had a beautiful daughter anyway. Well, yeah, she, the one well, she was in uh, Mad Max Fury, Fury Road. Road. Well, yeah. she's been in other shit too. Yeah, she was, that the girl's just cute. Yeah, I remember her from that. You're right. But uh, so yeah, so how he ends up? Well, this is kind of some fucked up too shit too. And all I'll say is I've seen. One particular plot point in this, like, compared to Old Boy, which, uh, you know, if you've seen Old Boy, you might know what I'm talking about, and if you've seen this movie. But um, what how he hooks up with Lisa Bonet is that when he goes down to uh, New Orleans, he's trying, like I said, he's trying to track down this singer named Johnny Favorite, who supposedly lo- owes this, you know, owes Louis Cipher or something, like, or broke a contract or whatever, and now he's trying to track him down. So he finds out that he had a mistress named Evangeline Proudfoot. And when he gets down to New Orleans, he finds out that she's dead, but her daughter, Epiphany, is still alive. And Epiphany is the one that's played by Lisa Bonet. Now, Lisa Bonet, I will note, was... I don't know how old she actually was when she shot this movie, but she's supposed to be 17 in the movie. So she's considerably younger than Mickey Rourke, but whatever. They didn't, it was the 80s. Nobody really cared about it. Um, 17 in, in the South would, is older than the age of consent anyway. Yeah. Especially in the 50s. In the 50s, it was probably 13, yeah. age of consent. Me growing up there, it was more like age of consent was 14, 15. Tammy and Louie yeah. said she was married to Lenny Kravitz for a minute. She was, yeah. I thought so. I thought yeah. she was, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, I feel bad because I really, really... I don't know. There's just so much going on in this movie, and it's like hard to talk about without spoiling what the big twist is. Um, Even though, like I said, I saw it a long time ago, and I didn't remember. I remember, you know, I remembered that Robert De Niro was the devil. That's not a secret. But I didn't remember what the big twist was. But when I was watching the movie, like I was a third of the way into it, and then I remembered. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is one, too, that I think is good to watch multiple times like in close succession because once you know what the twist is it's one of those ones where you can go back and look at how it makes it like a richer experience like once you know how the end is and like who everybody is um and you can go back and watch it and see like where all the shit happened and some of the stuff too like you said the with all the blood coming down from the ceiling and like some of the shit that happens in the movie Um, And that mysterious figure in black that he keeps seeing, you're not, it's kind of left ambiguous as to whether that person is really there, whether some of that stuff is really there or whether that's just the way that, um, that that Harry Angel is seeing it. Because some of the stuff, he has dreams that have this weird like um, imagery in it. And sometimes the dream imagery kind of bleeds over into what seems to be reality. So this is one of those movies where you really got to pay attention to... Because there's a lot of exposition, because pretty much the whole thing, it's like a noir in the sense that he goes to one person and then he gets this information from that person. That person ends up murdered, however, and then that leads him to another person and he goes and talks to that. So you really have to kind of listen to all the conversations to figure out, because it's kind of a complicated 
story. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so it's one of those ones where you really... And, and like I said, there's also a lot of weird dream imagery and a lot of like shit that's going on that you kind of have to... So if you see it twice, knowing what the end is. And the end of the book and the end of the movie are slightly different. But like I said, I'll, it'll spoil it if I say what the difference is. But it's not exactly the same. However, the author of the book, uh, William Hjorsberg, interestingly, he went on later because he wrote the novel and I think he wrote the first draft of the screenplay for this movie, like when it was in production a long time ago. He went on later and wrote the screenplay for Legend, the fantasy movie from 1985 with Tim Curry, you know, um, and Tom Cruise and Mia Sarah in it. So he uh, wrote the screenplay for that as well. But when the movie came out, he actually really liked it. He liked what would have been done with the story. And he said, oh, even though the novel was set entirely in New York City, still with the voodoo in it and everything, he said, I was actually considering putting some of it in New Orleans. So I think it's cool that Alan Parker actually did that uh, with the movie because he was considering it anyway. Interestingly, so this movie, it cost $18 million to make and it only made $17.2 million back hmm. at the theater. So it was kind of a disappointment. Um, it was actually released by the independent studio Carol Co., which also did all the Rambo movies and uh, yeah. stuff like that. Back in the day, I would always, I got something I got to say about this. But back in the day, I used to get this one and, and Angel Heart and Serpent and the Rainbow fucking mixed up a lot. Well, they're both kind of voodoo based. <laughs> yeah. Um, Although Serpent and the Rainbow is was set in Haiti, though. Yeah. E4 Mafia says this is one of the last movies that Mickey Rourke looked fucking normal looked in. Looked normal in. Yeah. And I th you just mentioned that they worked for the company and fucking made Rambo. Mickey Rourke and fucking Stallone started hanging around a lot to, together, and I fucking think they both went on fucking HGH and human growth hormone distort your face. It distorted yeah. both of their faces. They yep. were taking that shit. Somebody asked me earlier, "You taking that HGH?" And no, that's old school shit, man. Make your fucking nose and lips get huge. Fucking fucks your face up. That's why Stallone looks so bad in Rambo Four. Yeah, great movie, but he looked funny in that. He got his face fixed, though. He kept working on it. He fixed it back. He looks better. But they don't do that shit anymore. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Like, Mickey yeah. Rourke actually looks... He looks pretty good in this. I mean, for, <laughs> for looking like... He looks like, you know, a rundown, drunken gumshoe or whatever yeah. like he's supposed to. But he's still kind of like... Kind of foxy looking. Yeah. But... Oh, man, his face is fucked up now. Yeah, after that. Have yeah. you... Did you see uh, The Wrestler? The movie that he did... Uh. When was that? 2009? Maybe it was later than that. That was really, really good. They were taking that shit because they thought it was... Well, they thought that it was less risky than anabolic steroids. Uh-uh. Fuck no. It's less risky. It's a lot easier on your heart. But the side effects of fucking facial distortion, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah, well, just, just take less steroids, dude. <laughs> and Danny Rowling Ghostface says Rourke got his face mangled from boxing. Yeah, because he went through a boxing that face. Too. And bad plastic surgery. Yeah, well, the plastic surgery and everything was to, the, fix, to the, fix the fucking facial distortion from HGH. From HGH yeah. They just don't admit what they do, man. <laughs> fucking Stallone didn't admit that that was from HGH. But everybody in the scene fucking knows about PEDs, know that that's symptoms of HGH. Like your face getting Your all face like grows. Up. You grow, you gain mass in a different way that you would say you also taking, gain mass in you, your face you also gain mass in your fucking face <laughs> which is all somewhere little, you don't usually want it yeah your nose and your lips get you get real liver lipped and your nose gets fucking big gets like a lemon and you know there's a there's a uh, some female porn stars that were into the big booties and the big legs were taking that and their faces got fucked up and they had to fix those you know fucking Ryan Connor okay she fixed it <laughs> she fixed it though but if you look at Ryan Connor she's a fucking badass porn star she's my age she looks real young big old butt and legs and she works out but that's not from some of it's from anabolic steroids but a lot of it was from HGH and it fucked her face up she had a nose like a lemon for a little while she had, had to get a nose job see no thanks just, yeah, I don't think that's you're like how the hell did that nose get like that and that's HGH <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, because she didn't look like that when she was young. Just man, not worth it. Yeah, it's no, like, don't you know, mess with that one. Don't don't mess with that. Don't, don't mess with that one. Yikes! But yeah, so so when this came out, like I said, it didn't make a lot of money. But honestly, I think this is one of those ones that sort of aged like a fine wine. It got and critical reviews at the time were kind of mixed. Like I feel like nobody really explicitly shit on it. Uh, Roger Ebert liked it. I remember it got nominated for a bunch of Saturn Awards and stuff like that. So, and a lot of people thought Mickey Rourke was great in it. You know, De Niro was great in it. That everybody was great in it. Um, 
you know, it got a couple negative reviews with nothing too bad, but it just didn't really seem to hit with audiences. But it was one of those ones that, you know, as time went on after it came out on video and everything like that, it really became like a cult classic. And, you know, even big filmmakers like Christopher Nolan and stuff, he said, oh, this movie was a big inspiration for Memento, which was kind of his big for his first big breakout movie. Um, so and I, so I feel like this was kind of like a big inspiration for other creators as well. So it was one that wasn't really appreciated all that much at the time. But over time, it became a lot more appreciated, which is the best kind of movie, I think, even though it's got to suck, like when your movie comes out at the time and nobody goes to see it, you know. But, uh, you know, that's kind of what ends up happening with that one. But I think the reason why this aged so well, other than maybe the special effects, like with the um, with the, the Satan eyes on the baby at the end, that looks a little dodgy. But there weren't a lot of special effects in this, so it's it doesn't date it because of that. Also, I think because it was set in the 1950s and they did such a good job with this with the production design and the set decoration and everything like that they shot it in real locations but they still you know set designed it to, to look like the 1950s because it looks so authentic to the time period it doesn't seem like a movie that came out in the 80s you know what i mean it seems like a timeless kind of flick because it was set in the 50s it doesn't have any sort of 80s looking shit to it you know yeah because remember, because I feel like in the 80s, remember in the 80s, there was kind of like a 50s revival. There was a lot of stuff, you know, even like Back to the Future and stuff like that, where, you know, and uh, Rockabilly and all this kind of stuff kind of made a comeback. So everybody was sort of into the whole 50s vibe, right? So I feel like there were some movies that came out in the 80s that were supposed to be set in the 50s, but still totally looked like the 80s. This one is not one of those movies. This yeah, scam is talking about HGH. HGH is human growth hormone. It was big for a while, but it, side effects weren't that good. Yeah. They, yeah, most people stopped fucking with it. For, probably for for that reason. <laughs> well, some of those competition guys, they were on everything else. It was just one more thing they would add on to it because you could gain another five pounds. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, some, you know how it's like these girls that fucking have boob greed where no set of implants is big enough? They're yeah. just so gre- greedy. They got to have a bigger set. Over some of the competition bodybuilders were like that. Motherfucker's already huge. What the fuck? Oh, I got to get another five pounds. You know, and then they die. You know, yeah. it's just too much shit. You're not supposed to be that big. Well, yeah, I agree. I respect their work. You know what they want to do, but you're just not supposed to be that big. Your your heart just can't pump that much blood to that. Yeah, it's just a little guy. Yeah. In there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Fourth Throwdown brought up Peggy Sue Got Married. I forgot about that movie. Yeah, that was also set in the 50s. But like I said, a lot of the 50s, like set in the 50s movies that were made in the 80s still had an 80s veneer to them. This one really does not. I think because largely it was filmed in real locations and they didn't do that. Yes, they did some set design to make it look like the 50s, but they didn't do all that much. Just cars. They picked places that already looked like that. Yeah. um, You know, largely, so they didn't have to do a lot to it. And I just... Just everything about it just really evokes that time period. Like, you, in a way, I kind of, like, forgot that it was made in the 80s because there's just, like, nothing 80s about it at all, which is pretty amazing. But, um, yeah, I had forgotten. And I had forgotten, too, how unsettling this movie is in the sense that there's just something about it that's just really kind of, like, spellbinding. Because I, I was sitting there watching it, and I was just kind of like, I was first thing I thought was like, man, I forgot about how beautifully shot this movie was. And like I said, I saw it a long time ago, but I didn't remember exactly what it was about. I remembered it being sort of like a mystery and, you know, and voodoo and stuff. But that was all I remembered. And I just got sucked into it, man. And then like all of these creepy, like the one scene where he goes to that mission or whatever, and like the doors kind of swing in like that, and those two women like in the sort of nun habits are just kind of sitting there and they sit up and look at him. It's just like super, super creepy. And there's all just kind of like real unsettling imagery like that. And I think it's really, really well done. Like just this kind of slow burn type of is, you know, it, it is a horror movie, right? I mean, you'd call it a horror movie, but uh, yeah, it's, really. it's a noir with horror elements. It's a noir mystery, but it has horror elements because there are, because there's some gory shit in it. Like I I'd said. call it a supernatural detective thriller. Yeah. I would not so. I mean, there is gory stuff in it, but 
It's, I wouldn't call it a typical Hollywood horror movie, not by any stretch of the imagination. Well, no. More kind of like along the lines of um, Jacob's Ladder, maybe. Yeah, some people have compared it to that in the, in the yeah. sense that it's it's not really remotely the same, right. but it's the same vibe, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah, and Gramther said Lisa Bonet, dead in bed, freaked me out. Yeah, she got shot in the uh, veg. So, yeah, you know, there, there, some, some terrible shit happens in this movie. Like I said, people's hearts get cut out, you know. So there, there is some gory stuff, a lot of blood, you know. But it's still a detective movie, though. It is, yeah. It's a detective movie, and you're not really sure <coughs> if what you're seeing. You're not. It's kind of like you don't know if, if who's narrating this story is being honest with you. <laughs> Be a good way. Of, well, you don't know is this an alternate is this an alternate universe or what the hell's what the hell's happening? And you're not entirely sure that what you're seeing is real. That's what all I'm the saying. Time. Are you crazy? You know, it's that kind of deal. Like kind of like Jacob's Ladder. Yeah. That's, or like uh, Serpent and the Rainbow had yeah. a little bit of that too. Because yeah. this kind of does remind me a little bit of Serpent and the yeah. Rainbow, not just because of the voodoo, but because of you're not really sure if what you're seeing is true. Is, right, because of the weird like dreamlike imagery yeah. that pops up and you're not sure if like the character is just seeing that or if that's really happening or whatever. Like I said, it's, you know, very early in the movie when he goes to meet first with Louis Cipher, he comes into this mission or whatever and he goes up and the first thing he sees is this mysterious figure in black and he can't see their face and they're scrubbing like all of this blood off the wall. Who's calling me? I don't know. Oh, it's a starry night. Oh, <laughs> shit. We don't have time for that. <laughs> I, can't, the, I can't talk about that. Right I think now. the strong point of the movie is uh, the tone. Yeah. Tonally, the, mo the movie's spot on. Acting's great. The edit's fantastic. It's got a good score. It's a noir movie. Yeah. You, 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 you're not just watching it. You're kind of swimming through it. You're kind of enjoying it. You're not rushing the movie. You just it's just taking you through this thing. It's just there's no way to describe it. It's the tone. Yeah. It has a very romantic tone, even though all this weird shit's happening. I mean romantic in terms of like the nostalgic type yeah. of romance, you know. Kind of like a dark nostalgia to it in a certain way. But maybe just because it I saw it back when it was new, you know. Maybe. I it's, think I think the reason why it didn't get made earlier was because when he was shopping it around to all of the um different studios everybody wanted it to have a happy ending yeah which it doesn't no spoiler alert. <laughs> it's also kind of reminds me of that movie it was one that had all the stained glass it was taken taken wasn't that happening in chicago philly it was not dead riggers what flatliners uh, flatliners the one uh, where they were all coming back from the yeah but yeah they're coming back from the dead yeah. but but the thing is this flat i think it's because it was kind of in the same era but i mean visually no nah, it doesn't it doesn't i'm just kind of associating it with that because of of when it came out, it, but it's at that level, I guess you could say. Oh, nah, fuck it. <laughs> I'm gonna say more like Jacob's Ladder and yeah. and um, Serpent in the Rainbow. Yeah, About so like I that. mean, if you like those kind of movies, yeah. I think you probably dig this as well. It's the best way I can because it's kind of in that same right that same general area. Yeah, and um, then and also this that television series True Detective, the first season. Yeah. Kind of like that, too. Yeah. But it's, like I said, if you're, if, if, you definitely need to, like, immerse yourself in it. It's got right. a great score. I love, like, all the music in it. Um, a lot of the people that they got, like, to be in the bands, like, in New Orleans stuff, those were actual blues musicians. I think even, like, Dizzy Gillespie and stuff, like, they, like, tried out for the shit. Um, you know, so they, so a lot of them were kind of in the background. But it's just a really, really cool movie. And, I've, and I feel like, I don't know, it comes up on some lists of, like, best horror movies and stuff. But it's not a traditional horror movie. But I wonder why they don't do more horror noir. I mean, you know, there's been some, but I feel like it's a largely unexplored subgenre. And that's a shame, because I really like noir movies, and I really like horror movies. Panther says, I bet Tom saw this at Southgate Cinema. All the two movie screens. No, I saw that damn showboat. <laughs> Remember showboat? That was yeah. a dollar theater. Because, yeah, we would just wait for it to come out of the main theater and go to the dollar theater. That's what I used to do, too, Yeah, I was broke. Yeah. Or I we, would... we, were, we were watching one our own, on our, with our own money. Yeah. We were teenagers, you know what I mean? So, you know, you weren't going to ask your parents for the money. You just fucking, you know, instead of buying cigarettes, you bought cigarettes and then you went to go see the movie. Yeah. You know, which was the same price. Cigarettes were only a dollar twenty-five back then. Maybe a dollar fifteen, dollar ten for the Paul Malls. I remember those. 
And it still seemed like a lot of money. Oh, man, a dollar ten. Let me, big, let me get a big go. <laughs> let me walk, walk up to Showboat. I think that was in... Showboat was right behind... Uh, um, well, we didn't walk to Showboat. We did walk to Showboat sometimes, but then later we were driving because we got cars. But uh, that was uh, behind uh, Denny's. Yeah. Denny's, yeah. And they had all the little goth girls working at TC, TCBY's, the yogurt. Oh my God! Right Do you know what's funny all about this? Goth girls I just in there. I just recorded a review. Yeah. I just recorded a review for the Grady Hendrix books book, My Best Friend's Exorcism, which was set in 1988, and the girl uh, in the the main character she worked at TCBY also. Yeah. And that's what made me laugh. Grandpa's probably remembers a little redhead working in there, a little punk rock, little punk rocker who's probably about five foot ten. No, she's probably about four foot ten, little bitty. Dang, bright red hair. I think her name was Pam. Fucking, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah Pam. I think her name was Pam. Uh, Dean asked me, have I read any Robert R. McCammon? Yes, I have. Uh, didn't he write Boy's Life? If he wrote that, yeah. I read that a few years ago, and I loved it, and I'm going to probably revisit it for my book review show. Um, I know I've read more than that, but now I can't remember what it is. But yeah, I've read several of his books, and he is awesome. I agree. Um, how much are cigs in Florida these days? Oh, shit. I haven't bought a pack of cigarettes in a long time. I haven't either. Um, I think maybe the last time I bought a pack of Pall Malls, which is a couple years ago. They're probably two fifty, huh? No, I think it was 3 something or 4 something. Was it that much? Five. I can't remember. Been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, Dean said yes, he did. Yeah, Boy's Life was probably my favorite of his, but I, you know, I've read several, but I can't remember like all the different ones that I read. Um, all right, so do we have anything else that we need to discuss? Yes, no. Uh, no, just uh, just, <laughs> Grantler's just saying. Yeah, he forgot about Showboat. That was in Riverview. Yeah, you sneak into the R-rated movies all the time. Yeah, look at right. And he and then he tells me it's a girl's named Pam or Trouble. So a girl's named Rhonda and Sherry. We know. I know exactly who you're talking I, about. Well, dude. I agree with that. Rhonda and Sherry. Because I knew girls named yeah. all of those things, and yeah, sure. Right yeah, I dated both of them. <laughs> I dated both Rhonda and Sherry. Rhonda was Rhonda was the keeper out of that one, but it fucking didn't work out. <laughs> didn't work out. Too many guys were gutted for it. Oh, uh, fucking. You couldn't take the competition. Hey, man. You know what I mean? Fucking. There was a lot of young guys fucking running around at that time. Fucking Rhonda was cute, man. So was Sherry. Yeah. Not Pam, though? Pam was a little punk rocker, and she didn't go to school with us. She went to school at another high school. She went to school, I think, in Riverview. And uh, she was just this little bitty punk rock girl with fucking bright orange hair. Just you I said it was red, but it wasn't. It was orange. Girl. Yeah. It was orange, yeah. She was cute. Yeah, back then we had, yeah. a, doll we had a dollar theater in Daytona, too, at the Daytona Mall, which was the, kind of the downbeat mall. Yeah. down the street from the yeah. nicer mall which was built in the late 70s or 80s or whatever yeah. and uh that was i don't think i saw angel heart in the theater though i think i saw it i rented it or i saw it on cable which means i probably saw it in 89 or 90 something like that because i feel i graduated from 1990 and i remember me and my friend used to rent a lot of movies or go yeah. to the dollar theater like right around 89 or 90 and 91 no, Graham, I don't think I dated Sherry. Just Rhonda. But I remember I remember Sherry. There's another redhead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You ready to wrap it up? Yep. All right. So if you haven't seen Angel Heart, I didn't really spoil it because I feel like a lot of people haven't seen it. It's a little bit of a cult classic. Um, kind of good, went under the radar. Came out in 1987. Pretty sure you can watch it on Amazon Prime for free, and I think you can also watch it on Hulu for free, and maybe Pluto, Pluto.tv as well. So go check it out if you really like kind of voodoo movies or like creepy noir movies or shit that's like kind of underrated from the 80s, because I feel like it's a really good one and not a lot of people talk about it. So definitely go and watch it. And uh, we will see you guys. Ooh, tomorrow's Wednesday, right? All right, so tomorrow yeah. night we're doing the sidetrack show. So we'll get drunk and talk to you guys about whatever. Mm. So that'll be fun. All right. So no sexual tyrannosaur today? No, oh, hold on. I'm going to leave. As a <laughs> I'm going to leave as a sexual dinosaur. I'm going to sign off go. as a fucking sexual. Make it a goddamn sexual dinosaur. I was like, if you, you might as well like do it because you I carried the hat I in can't, here. I can't fucking remember all my duties at all the time. That's what I got you here for. 
Like I, well, to I have to, I have to remember all of my shit, and I have to remember yeah, all his well, just, shit as well. Yeah, she's got to remind me when to this become. This is why I'm tired all the become time. Become a sexual dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we will see you guys tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Sidetrack Show. Yeah. Have a good rest of your day, yeah. and uh, we'll see you later. Bye.